I want to thank uh, Dr. Miller for inviting me here uh, today to, to lecture and to uh, share some of my experiences with you. Now, I never had the opportunity to take the board exam that you guys are studying for, so uh, for in preparation for this thing, I went back through the last five years' worth of uh, self-assessment exams and the uh, in-training service exams and reviewed everything that, that looked like it was important for the, for the board examination and tried to break that, you know, culminate that all down into uh, 90 minutes. So we gotta, we're going to have to fly through this. But everything that you're going to see up here today is stuff that has shown up multiple times on these other exams. So we'll try to get through and uh, get a good review for you. We're going to start out just with the basis of MRI real quickly. In musculoskeletal imaging, we basically deal with T1 and T2 weighted images. And as long as, you're, uh, as long as you can differentiate between the two when you're looking at an image, uh, then you're going to be in good shape. The T1-weighted images have a short TR and a short TE, and they're, we call them our anatomy image. Uh, it has very high resolution, and we can see the anatomy very nicely. And the main difference between a T1 and a T2 is that the T1-weighted uh, image, the fluid is in intermediate in signal intensity. It looks very similar to muscle, whereas on the T2-weighted image, you're going to have bright fluid, and that's how you can distinguish between the two. Now, when we're looking at a... Uh, MR image trying to determine if this is a T1 or T2 weighted image. The muscle is going to be intermediate. Fluid is also going to be intermediate. So if you see fluid within muscle, you won't be able to distinguish the two. Calcium would be dark, as we see here in this calcific tendonitis. The cortex is dark. Uh, the fibrous tissues, such as the uh, labrum and rotator cuff, is going to be dark. And then the fat is bright. So our subcutaneous fat and the marrow fat is going to be bright. A T2 weighted image, on the other hand, about the only difference is the fact that the fluid is, the fluid is bright rather than intermediate. So if you have an image, look where there's supposed to be fluid or look where fluid might be. If you see something bright in the joint, then you're dealing with a T2-weighted image rather than a T1-weighted image. The other thing is uh, when we do a T2-weighted image, we almost always put fat saturation on it in order to make the fluid, uh, which is associated with the pathology, more conspicuous. And so if you look in the subcutaneous soft tissues and it's dark, uh, then this is usually a T2-weighted image that's had fat saturation. Same thing with the marrow. Okay, CT, uh, you may see a CT on the imaging part of the exam. If you do, uh, they're going to be asking you to describe a complex fracture, either in the axial skeleton, one of the intraarticular uh, fractures, or a hardware complication. So CT may show up once or twice on the exam. Uh, typically, it's going to be uh, for one of these indications. The other, thing, the other reason they might show you a CT examination is to show you a matrix uh, such as chondroid or osteoid matrix, and uh, Dr. Parsons talked about that earlier in the week. So CT, uh, going on to nuclear medicine, just a brief overview. There's really three types of exams that uh, we use in bone imaging, uh, either the bone scan with technesium 99M, MD3, gallium scan, or a white blood cell tagged scan. Uh, with nuclear medicine, it's a great screening tool, very highly sensitive. You can look at the whole skeleton at one time, but there's very poor anatomic detail. I mean, trying to uh, distinguish between a, you know, whether the fractures in the proximal or distal pole than the navicular bone is going to be very difficult with a, a study like this. But it's very highly sensitive, and the indications you'll be uh, seeing on the boards will be radiographically occult lesions, orthopedic infections, evaluation of incidental bone lesions, and also if there's a single lesion and you want to survey the entire skeleton to see if there's multiple lesions, which may change your differential. Now, this is a, a nice example of what they might show on the boards a, uh, uh, a individual who's a runner that has uh, tibial pain and comes in with an overuse injury. The plain film is normal. We see this area of linear increased uptake on the bone scan, and this represents a stress fracture. Now, when we do nuclear medicine bone scan, we usually do a three-phase. You may have heard that term before. The first phase, once we inject the technesium 99M, we scan over the area of interest in the first few seconds, and this is an arterial phase. These are the two hands. We see that in the right hand there's increased uh, blood flow. And then over the next two to three minutes we get a blood pool or a venous phase and there's increased uptake in this area again. And then we do a delayed scan. Typically about four hours later all the uh, activities out of the soft tissues, now it's in the bone. And we see a radiographically occult uh, scaphoid fracture. So these are the three, uh, the three phases that you'll see. The arterial phase, blood pool phase, and the four hour delay. Over the last couple of years we've added CT to nuclear medicine bone scan imaging. Uh, this is a, a planar image where you're just looking straight through uh, the lumbar spine from anterior to posterior, and we see a little bit of increased uptake in the L4 
vertebral body. In the past, that would have been, we, could have, we would have just known that there's some increased uptake in that area. Now we can do uh, CT examination. We can look in the chronal plane. We see that there's abnormal uptake at the L4 level. We do a sagittal plane, and we can see that the increased uptake is in the posterior elements. And then we do an axial cut, and we can see that the uptake is in the right region of the pars intraarticularis on the right. So rather than just knowing that there's something going on at the L4 level, uh, when you add the spec or the CT imaging, we can increase the, the specificity. Now, uh, Ted Parsons may have talked uh, briefly about this, but nuclear medicine bone scan, they may show you uh, a bone scan in conjunction with a plain film finding to determine if there's activity within a bone lesion. And this is a, a lucent lesion that was uh, picked up in the proximal femur. We do a bone scan, and it's cold in that area, so this is not an active lesion. This turned out to be a, a, a bone cyst. And then finally, for infections, uh, if there's been no trauma or surgery, the bone scan is going to be the first, uh, first scan to use. If there has been recent trauma or surgery, you can go to a labeled white blood cell, which will have a higher specificity for infection. Uh, this doesn't work too well in the spine, however, so if there's been recent surgery or trauma in the spine, we can do a bone, bone scan combined with gallium uh, scan and look for discordant uptake or infection. So that kind of covers the imaging modalities that you need to know about. We're going to get, jump right into the shoulder. And we'll just go through each of the joints, and we're going to cover the lesions that uh, are, are covered multiple times in these uh, prior tests that I had the chance to review. And one of the uh, things that they repeatedly demonstrated on the exam was osteolysis of the distal clavicle. And this is a uh, post-traumatic osteolysis. Typically occurs within a couple months of uh, acute trauma. Uh, can be related to repetitive stress injury, uh, such as seen in weightlifters. And what we're going to see on the radiograph is you're going to see a loss of the normal cortical white line and maybe some lucency within the distal one to two centimeters of the clavicle. The acromion will be completely normal in appearance. If they show you an MR, you'll see high signal within the distal uh, aspect of the clavicle. You may see some periostitis with some fluid in the periosteum. You may see some pericapsular edema, uh, but the acromion itself will be completely normal in appearance. So if you get this, this appearance, this is osteolysis of the distal clavicle. Abnormalities isolated to the clavicle. The okay, diagnosis here, uh, anterior dislocation, shoulder moves inferior and medially with the anterior dislocation. What they're more likely to show you on the exam are some of the lesions that occur secondary to a dislocation. And uh, this is a classic example of what they might show you. They'll show you an AP view with flattening of the posterior lateral humeral head and expect you to uh, know that this is a Hillsax defect and that it occurs secondary to impaction against the anterior inferior glenoid. And may not show there, but there's also a small bony uh, avulsion fragment uh, representing an osseous glenoid fracture or an osseous Bankart lesion. And it's the, hill, or it's the West Point view that's the best view for uh, demonstrating one of these osseous Bankart lesions. We lay the patient supine, their arm is draped over the table, and then it's a modified axillary view. By doing this, we can accentuate that little bony uh, fragment or the osseous Bankart lesion. So that's the West Point view that's the best for detecting that. Now, they may also show you a, a labral lesion that's associated with uh, dislocation. If they show you an axial MR image through the, through the glenohumeral joint, uh, they're, they're showing you a bank heart lesion, either a, either a bank heart or a reverse bank heart lesion. So we just need to understand what the normal appearance of the uh, labrum is. It's usually dark and triangular in appearance, firmly attached to the glenoid. Uh, it's dark because it's made of fibrocartilage. The hyaline cartilage is intermediate in signal intensity. We may either see some fluid or, or contrast within the joint, but we shouldn't see any fluid coming deep or into the substance of that triangle. Now, when we see an osseous bank heart lesion, uh, either a fibrous or an osseous bank heart lesion, we'll see displacement with fluid coming deep between the osseous uh, glenoid and the fibrous uh, labrum, or you may see a piece of bone taken with this, so they... Uh, would be likely to either ask you uh, for a diagnosis, which is a bank heart lesion in this case, or an osseous bank heart lesion, if there's a piece of cortex taken with it, or they may ask you uh, what the mechanism was that led to this, which would be an anterior dislocation. Okay, they also like to show the Hillsax lesion in the axial plane. And when you look at the upper three cuts of the humeral head, it should be perfectly round. There shouldn't be any concavity or flattening of the posterior aspect of the humeral head. When we see an uh, anterior dislocation, the humeral head impacts against the undersurface of the glenoid, and it results in this concavity 
in the upper three images, upper three axial images through the humeral head. So if you see any flattening, whether it's on MR or CT, if you see any flattening in one of the upper three images of the humeral head, that represents a Hill Sachs lesion associated with an anterior dislocation. And here we see an abnormal uh, displaced anterior inferior labrum as well. <clears throat> if they show you a coronal image through the labrum, they're uh, trying to get you to make the diagnosis of a slap tear. And the normal superior labrum uh, is triangular in appearance. It's dark, hangs off the uh, top of the osseous glenoid. And we often have this hyaline cartilage which undermines it, and this is intermediate in signal intensity. But we should never see any high signal going out into this triangle. So if any signal violates the triangle, that represents a slap tear. And they're typically going to show this in a coronal imaging plane. So this is what that normal black triangle looks like. When we see signal violating that triangle and coming out into the triangle, as seen here in the artwork and in the MR image, uh, this is uh, consistent with a slap tear. <clears throat> posterior dislocation is something that they like to show uh, images of. And with posterior dislocation, the humeral head goes straight back rather than moving inferior and medially. And sometimes it's very difficult to make the diagnosis on plain film. In some studies, up to 50% of these uh, posterior dislocations are missed on the initial plain film if you just have an AP view. But the one uh, key that you need to remember is that with posterior dislocation, the humeral head is going to be locked in internal rotation. So if, they, if the uh, tech brings you two films, one marked internal rotation, one marked external rotation, and the film looks identical, then you either have a really bad tech or the patient has a posterior dislocation. So you need to uh, evaluate that further. And the axillary view is a great way to look at that further. <clears throat> With the axillary view, uh, the posterior dislocation becomes very obvious. Here's the glenoid. Here's the humeral head sitting posteriorly. And here's the reverse Hill Sachs lesion associated with that posterior dislocation. Now, if I show you an MR image of a posterior dislocation, it'll look just like that plain film. We'll have a divot out of the anterior aspect of the uh, humeral head representing a reverse Hill Sachs lesion. And note, it, uh, with the reverse Hill Sachs lesion, it's in the mid-humeral head rather than the superior aspect because the humeral head moves straight back. And then we'll see contrast or fluid coming deep to the posterior labrum, representing a posterior labral tear. Now, this can occur secondary to either a dislocation or with repetitive microtrauma, as in the weightlifters that do a lot of bench pressing. So that pretty much covers the labrum and the things they might ask. They'll ask, they're either going to show you a bank heart or reverse bank heart, possibly a Hill Sachs lesion, and once you'd be able to distinguish between anterior and posterior dislocation. With the rotator cuff imaging, uh, almost every exam I looked at had a question about regarding the rotator cuff, and these are the most common things I covered. First of all, the rotator cuff, the musculotendinous junction, lives at the 12 o'clock position of the humeral head. This is a T1-weighted image. We know it's T1-weighted because we have bright signal fat. We have uh, subcutaneous high signal fat. We don't see any fluid here in the joint, so this is a T1-weighted image. The cuff should be dark on T1 and T2-weighted imaging. It's made out of fibrous material. And as the cuff comes across, we shouldn't see any intermediate or high signal within the cuff all the way down to the bone. So you want to be able to follow this black line all the way down to the bone, make sure it uh, touches the bone without any high signal. Uh, tendinopathy will appear as thickening of the tendon, and, they'll see, and you'll see intermediate signal intensity. Instead of being totally black, this tendon should be completely black. We see this intermediate signal. This represents tendinopathy. Now, we know this is a T2-weighted image because we see high signal bright fluid within the joint space. We see saturation of the subcutaneous fat. So we know this is a T2-weighted image with, uh, with fat saturation. Another entity that they uh, like to show is calcific bursitis or tendonitis. And with this entity, you're just going to see a globular area of low signal abnormality representing the calcification. You may see some high signal surrounding it, secondary to inflammation and uh, and tendinosis. Okay, rotator cuff tear is a very common uh, entity that they like to show on these exams. And to diagnose a rotator cuff tear, again, you want to find that musculotendinous junction. If they show you a coronal image of the, of the shoulder, follow that cuff all the way across, and you should be able to follow it all the way down until it touches uh, the bone on the greater tuberosity. As we're coming along here, we see this area of high signal abnormality right in the location where the cuff is expected. And this represents a full thickness tear of the supraspinatus tendon. Here we have one there where there's a massive tear with retraction of the tendon, and this represents a massive rotator cuff tear. Now, these are both T2-weighted images. We have fat saturation. We have fluid within the joint space. We come down to this image, 
and we see that there's bright subcutaneous tissue, bright bone, uh, no, no fluid in the joint. So we know this is a T1 weighted image. As we look at the rotator cuff and we look at the supraspinatus muscle, we see high signal streaks within the rotator cuff within the, uh, within the supraspinatus muscle. So this represents extensive fatty atrophy of the supraspinatus muscle. <clears throat> Another very common uh, uh, entity that they like to show is paralabral cyst, and they ask these questions in a multiple, uh, multiple array of, of ways. They can either just ask for the diagnosis, and here we see the superior labrum has a signal going out into the triangle, so this represents a slap tear. We have this lobulated mass arising adjacent to the slap tear, which re represents paralabral cyst, and it's dissecting down into the suprascapular notch. Uh, so the other image they're likely to show you is this next image. This represents, so this is a T2-weighted chronal image showing high signal within both the supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons. And this represents acute denervation atrophy, uh, acute denervation edema within the muscles. And the question may be what, what nerve has been uh, compressed by the paralabral cyst? And this would be the suprascapular nerve. Now, if this uh, cyst dissected more posteriorly into the spinal glenoid notch, you would only have high signal within the infraspinatus muscle because the, the innervation of the supraspinatus would have already occurred. They may also show one coming down inferiorly into the quadrilateral space, and they may show denervation atrophy of the uh, deltoid and of the uh, teres minor, and then you'd need to know that that was a quadrilateral space syndrome with axillary nerve entrapment. Okay, so this is the classic uh, question they'll ask. They'll show you this picture and ask what the diagnosis is, and you'll have a list of four or five things to choose from. Here we see the supraspinatus muscle. The musculotendinous junction is markedly retracted. Here's the tendon coming across. should be coming all the way across to the uh, greater tuberosity, but we see it stop here, and we see high signal fluid in the expected location, and this represents a rotator cuff tear. Uh, another classic question that they would ask, this is a, a patient with shoulder pain and weakness, and the question would be, what is the most likely diagnosis? We see that these are T1-weighted images because we see the bright subcutaneous fat, no, no fluid within the joint space. As we come up and look, we see that there's extensive fatty atrophy with high signal within the deltoid and within the teres minor, and this represents a quadrilateral space syndrome with denervation atrophy of the deltoid and the teres minor. <clears throat> Another very common question uh, when reviewing the last five years worth of in-service exams is this right here. Here's a 40-year-old man who came in with a gradual onset of shoulder pain. What is the most likely diagnosis? Uh, in this particular case, we have this geographic area of subchondral uh, abnormality within the humeral head. When we go to our T2-weighted image, we have a bright line with a parallel dark line, and this represents the double line sign, and this is diagnostic of avascular necrosis. If you put this in the humeral head, femoral head, talus, uh, femoral shaft, patella, it doesn't matter where you put this. If you see a geographic, well-defined area of signal abnormality with a parallel white and uh, black line. This represents the granulation interface and represents avascular necrosis. Okay, this was a 26-year-old gentleman who came in with progressive shoulder pain for two years following arthroscopic assisted bank heart repair and thermal capsulography. Uh, his preoperative study demonstrates normal articular cartilage, normal subchondral marrow edema. Comes back in two years later with persistent pain and decreased range of motion. And at this time, we see complete loss of the articular cartilage, subchondral marrow signal changes. He's developed severe osteoarthritis. And this is a, a severe chondrolysis of the glenohumeral joint following thermal capsulography. <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's what you need to know about the shoulder. You need to be able to identify slap tears, anterior and posterior labral tears, the uh, bank heart, whether it's osseous or fibrous, the hill sacs defect and then the, know the innervation of the muscle groups and be able to identify the muscle and which nerve innervates those muscle groups. We'll move on to the elbow. Now this is a, a weight lifter that came in with pain and a palpable mass in the upper arm. We see this area of ill-defined uh, soft tissue calcification in the region of the biceps. When we do an MR, we have our T1-weighted image with the bright subcutaneous fat. Uh, the water signal within this mass is similar to muscle. We look at our T2, we see high signals. This is an indeterminate soft tissue mass. When we do our uh, sagittal images, we can see this kind of rim uh, around this mass with extensive soft tissue edema within the biceps muscle. So we follow this up with a uh, CT exam. And as I stated earlier, if they show you a CT exam, they're either showing you a complex fracture that they're going to ask you some questions about, 
or they're showing you a mass where they want you to talk about the matrix. Uh, and in this particular mass, we see this well-defined, what almost looks like cortex surrounding this uh, soft tissue mass. And this is what myositis ossificans looks like. Uh, here we see a uh, different patient, very similar uh, uh, pathologic process. Here's the humeral shaft. Here we see this soft tissue mass calcified with what looks like a rim of cortex around it. So if you see this appearance on a CT or plain foam, this is myositis ossificans. Most tumors will have central calcification, and the, uh, the, the, the calcification will be more central rather than peripheral. Okay, another uh, entity that they covered repeatedly was the posterior dislocation of the, uh, of the elbow. And they would show different findings, whether it's the fractures that are associated with posterior dislocation or the soft tissue findings on MR, and uh, expect you to be able to draw the conclusion that the patient had had a prior dislocation. And this is uh, just post-traumatic ossification that occurs within the uh, sub subperiosteum and also in the capsular hematoma, common complication following posterior dislocation. And if you see this appearance, uh, this patient has had a prior posterior dislocation of the elbow. Uh, when these patients get dislocations of the elbow, uh, with an adult, they usually uh, sustain a fracture to the coronoid and the radial head. So if you're shown a lateral view with, a, with the combination of a radial head fracture and a coronoid fracture, or they may show you an MR appearance with a coronoid a fracture or coronoid edema and a radial head fracture, this patient's had a prior dislocation. In a child, it's more likely to be an involution of the medial epicondyle. Uh, the sale sign is something that they uh, have reviewed on a couple different occasions, and this just represents a uh, large effusion within the uh, elbow. And, of course, in an adult, the, more, the most likely thing is an occult radial head fracture, whereas in a child, the most likely diagnosis is going to be an occult uh, supracondylar fracture. When we look at fractures on MR imaging, uh, usually they're linear, dark signal on T1. Uh, on T2, they can be dark or bright, depending upon if there's fluid tracking within the uh, fracture fragment. So when you see uh, linear areas of dark signal on T1, linear areas of dark or bright signal on T2, these represent fractures. And this is just a, a, a child that has sustained a posterior dislocation with avulsion of the medial epicondyle. These can become entrapped following reduction. We can see this on MR imaging or on plain film imaging. They may show you either one and expect you to uh, know the relationship with the posterior dislocation. And then finally, they may show you an MR with the soft tissue injuries that are associated with posterior dislocation. And these include disruption of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. So this is the radial head and the coronal plane. We see the lateral ulnar collateral ligament arises along the medial epicondyle, comes back and forms a sling along the posterior aspect of the radial head and neck, prevents posterior rotatory subluxation of the radial head, and with posterior dislocation, this is often disrupted near the uh, medial epicondyle, I'm sorry, near the lateral epicondyle. And then also on the sagittal plane, we'll see disruption of the posterior capsule. There may or may not be an associated radial head fracture or coron coronoid injury associated with this. If you see this pattern uh, of soft tissue injury, this is associated with the prior uh, posterior dislocation of the elbow. Another uh, diagnosis they like to show is biceps tendon injury. The biceps tendon is best seen in the sagittal imaging plane on T2-weighted uh, sequence. We see bright fluid in the joints. We know this is a T2-weighted sequence. Here's the biceps muscle, the tendon arising out of it. And the musculotendinous junction usually sits five or six centimeters above the insertion on the radial uh, tuberosity. Uh, the appearance of a tear will be that of a retracted musculotendinous junction with this wavy and then disrupted biceps tendon. Oftentimes it's, oftentimes it's retracted five, six, seven centimeters, so it has a strange kind of appearance of a piece of pasta or wavy, uh, you know, wavy pasta sitting up here in the anterior arms. So this is what a biceps tendon rupture will look like. Uh, alternatively, they may show you a triceps tendon disruption in the sagittal plane. And here we see the normal triceps tendon coming down and inserting into the olecranon, and here we see a full thickness tear with adjacent edema. <clears throat> they also like to uh, show medial and lateral epicondylitis, and we just need to know the anatomy and know what the pathology looks like if you have medial or lateral epicondylitis. Along the lateral elbow, we have the common extensor tendon coming in and inserting into the lateral epicondyle. Normally, this is completely dark. This is a tendon, so it should be black on T1 and T2. If you see any high signal within the, uh, within the tendon at its insertion site, then we have either a partial or full thickness tear. And then often associated with the common extensor tendinopathy or tear, 
is the underlying radial collateral ligament injury. And here we see thickening and high signal within the radial collateral ligament representing a partial thickness tear of the radial collateral ligament. The medial elbow can be a little more tricky. The ulnar collateral ligament has a little bit of a uh, more curvy S-shaped appearance to it, arises uh, up here approximately on the medial epicondyle, comes down, and then inserts uh, very tightly onto the, uh, onto the sublime tubercle of the, of the uh, proximal, hum uh, proximal uh, ulna. There should be a very tight junction here. No fluid whatsoever should come between the ulnar collateral ligament and the, and the ulna. If we see any fluid coming between it, as we see here, this represents a partial thickness tear of the ulnar collateral ligament. Uh, this, this ends a lot of professional baseball players' uh, time. If, they, if we get a full thickness tear, it's usually right through the mid-substance of the ligament. So full thickness tear is usually mid-substance. Partial thickness tears typically occur at the ulnar attachment site with fluid tracking down. And this is referred to as the T sign because we have fluid coming and then going in both directions here. <clears throat> okay, another common entity shown on the MR of the elbow is uh, osteochondritis desiccans of the capitellum. Uh, this occurs with the uh, throwing mechanism. We get distraction forces medially and compression forces laterally, and the capitellum compresses against the radial head, and we get uh, either shearing injuries or impaction injuries resulting in articular cartilage abnormality and even osteochondral injuries, and here we have a loose body in the anterior joint with the uh, OCD of the capitellum. Okay, they also mentioned on, on a couple of these exams, they mentioned the name fractures of the forearm, so we'll just review them very briefly, make sure you know the uh, named fractures of the forearm. The montasia is the uh, proximal third ulnar fracture with radial head dislocation, usually from a fall on an outstretched arm. Uh, the Galeazzi fracture is the distal radial fracture, typically with a, a disruption or dislocation of the distal radial ulnar joint. And then the Essex Lopresti uh, fracture, they may show you a severely comminuted radial head fracture and ask you what soft tissue injuries can be associated with this. And this can be associated with disruption of the um, interosseous ligament. We can nicely show this with either MR or ultrasound examination showing disruption. This is what an intact interosseous ligament looks like, and this is what a disrupted one would look like. And if this is disrupted, then that can alter your uh, treatment for the radial head fracture. Okay, moving on to the uh, imaging of the wrist. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the injuries that occur on the fall on the outstretched hand. Uh, tendinopathy or tenosynovitis, this is a, uh, a common uh, entity that they showed on the in-service exams. Uh, and there's two or three tendons that are more common. The flexor carpi radialis is one of the more common tendons to get uh, uh, tendinopathy or tenosynovitis. If we see fluid within the tendon sheath, that's tenosynovitis. If we start to see thickening or intrasubstance signal within the tendon itself, that represents tendinopathy. A de Quervain syndrome involves the extensor pollicis brevis and ad abductor pollicis longus. We'll see high signal surrounding those, and we may even see some high signal reactive edema within the adjacent radial styloid. So de Quervain syndrome. <clears throat> Okay, uh, disruption of the scapholunate ligament. Uh, they may show this as a plain film finding or as an MR finding. And when you're evaluating an AP view of the wrist, you want to make sure that the intercarpal distance is symmetric throughout the wrist. And if you see this appearance, this is diagnostic of a, a scapholunate uh, ligament tear and scapholunate disassociation. Uh, the, the plain film finding that can accentuate this is called the clenched fist view where you have the patient clench the fist and it will accentuate uh, the difference here. Uh, typically, the intercarpal distance is less than two millimeters. Anything greater than three is abnormal. They may also show you uh, MR appearance. And with MR appearance, there's typically a watertight ligament coming across the scapholunate ligament. If we see either contrast or fluid on a T2-weighted image uh, breaching or perforating the scapholunate ligament, that represents a tear of the scapholunate ligament. Potentially, they could show you the uh, lunotriquetral ligament, but that's uh, unlikely they would show that. If they're going to show one of these ligaments, it's going to be the scapholunate ligament or the triangular fiber cartilage. Uh, they may also show a carpal dislocation. And uh, in, a, in the frontal view, the, the lunate is typically uh, quadrilateral or has four sides to it. When we see this triangular appearance, however, uh, that represents a lunate dislocation. And they may ask you to differentiate between a lunate and a perilunate dislocation on the basis of 
plain film imaging with a uh, lunate dislocation. We have complete uh, dislocation of the lunate out proximally. The capitellum still sits in its normal position, and this would be the normal position of the lunate here. Whereas in a perilunate dislocation, uh, the lunate maintains its normal position, but the, uh, but the capitate has dislocated posteriorly, as shown in this case. Here's the distal radius. The lunate still articulates with the distal radius, but the, cap the capitate uh, sits posteriorly. So this would be a perilunate dislocation rather than a lunate dislocation. <clears throat> okay, ulnar impaction syndrome. Uh, all you need to know about this is listed on the slide here. Uh, this is typically associated with positive ulnar uh, variants. Uh, it results in perforation of the triangular fiber cartilage. This is where the triangular fiber cartilage sits. There's impaction of the distal ulna against the lunate. This results in a tear of the triangular fiber cartilage, ulnar-sided pain. Eventually, they tear, uh, tear up the articular cartilage, and they get a uh, chondrosis or an arthrosis here. Then they start to get osteoarthritis with subchondral cyst formation and subchondral marrow edema. Now, that may also show you the perforation of the triangular fiber cartilage, which typically sits right across uh, uh, between the, uh, or extending from the distal radius to the distal ulna. Uh, in this case, we have a mild positive ulnar variance, and we have some marrow edema within the adjacent lunate representing impaction and a full thickness tear of the central aspect of the triangular fiber cartilage. Okay, what's the diagnosis here? We see a fracture through the waist of the scaphoid. And if we look a little closer, we see that there's a, a difference in the density of the proximal and distal fragments. The proximal fragment uh, demonstrates increased density, and this represents scaphoid fracture with avascular necrosis. So they may show you uh, the plain foam finding, and if, if, if we see avascular necrosis on the plain foam, we're going to see increased density in the proximal fragment, or they may show you the MR finding. This is a T1-weighted image. Again, we see the uh, subcutaneous fat, which is bright. We see the fat bright, uh, fat bone marrow within the bones, or the uh, bright marrow uh, within, the, within the bones, and we don't see any joint effusion. So we know this is a T1-weighted image, and we see decreased signal abnormality within the proximal pole. Just remember this is a recurrent uh, blood supply, and uh, it's the proximal pole that's going to get avascular necrosis. They also show a case of avascular necrosis of the lunate, or Kindbox. This is a 27-year-old with ulnar-sided wrist pain. Uh, the original film showed some slight increased density and some areas of lucency within the lunate. Three-month follow-up has shown now complete collapse of the lunate with marked increased density, and this is a, a Kindbox disease or AVN of the lunate. Uh, they can also show this on MR with high signal on T2 or low signal within the lunate on T1. Okay, what about this diagnosis? Here we see an axial view through the wrist. This is the carpal tunnel. We see this focal mass within the carpal tunnel. Uh, T1, T2-weighted image. Here's a T2-weighted image. This is bright on T2. Low signal intensity on T1. So this follows water signal, and this represents a, a ganglion within the carpal tunnel. Now, typically, MRI is not required as part of your workup of carpal tunnel. Uh, it's indicated if you have an atypical presentation, failed surgical case, or if for some reason you suspect a mass. In the majority of the run-of-the-mill uh, carpal tunnel syndromes, uh, MR has very little to offer. Again, yeah, that's going to be the median nerve distribution. Okay, the Stenner lesion occurs when we have a tear of the ulnar collateral ligament, and they may show you a, a plain film where you'll see a little avulsion. Remember, there is a, an accessory oscle here, but in addition, in this case, we have a avulsion at the base of the uh, proximal phalanx. If you remember the anatomy, the adductor aponeurosis comes across in, in kind of an oblique or perpendicular fashion, uh, perpendicular to the long axis of the, of the thumb. And when we get a tear of the ulnar collateral ligament with an avulsion, it can retract uh, proximal to that adductor aponeurosis and become entrapped. And that's the Stenner's lesion and requires repair. They may also show you an MR finding with a retracted and torn ulnar collateral ligament. And this ligament here should be sitting in this uh, position here and attached to the base of the proximal phalanx. It's retracted deep to the adductor aponeurosis, Stenner's lesion. Another common thing they like to show is these avulsion fractures around the uh, digits and ask uh, what the soft tissue abnormalities associated with them are or what the mechanisms of the injury are. So we'll just review these very briefly. Uh, here's an avulsion fracture at the base of the distal phalanx on the extensor surface, and this uh, occurs when we have a, uh, a sudden flexion uh, 
in someone who has active extension of the finger, uh, and this is an avulsion of the extensor digitorum tendon, we can get uh, volar plate uh, avulsion injuries associated with hyperextension or dislocation. These can occur at the uh, PIP or at the DIP joint. That volar plate is just a very tough uh, portion of the fibrous capsule along the volar aspect, and that can result in an avulsion of the base of the phalanx. Now, distally, if you get an avulsion, then you have to be concerned about an avulsion of the flexor digitorum or the jersey finger. Most commonly involves the fourth digit. Uh, this typically happens when someone grabs a jersey and all their fingers slide off except the fourth, and then, then the jersey takes the, uh, uh, the flexor tendon with it, uh, so to speak. Now, what happens when we image these is a lot of times as the person contracts that flexor tendon or the flexor muscle, it'll pull this piece of bone way proximal. Here we see in this case the flexor tendon is retracted all the way down to the metacarpal level. I've seen this piece of bone retract all the way proximal to the PIP joint. So if you see a very proximal fragment, uh, you need to look up at the donor site at the, uh, at the distal phalanx. Make sure that you're not dealing with an avulsion uh, off the distal phalanx from an uh, avulsion of the flexor digitorum with retraction of the tendon. And then finally, uh, isolated uh, tendon pulley injuries. We may see disruption of the pulley. This is a rock climber injury. And in this case, the flexor tendon pulleys have disrupted. Now we get bowstringing of the flexor tendon and increased distance between the uh, flexor tendon and the bone when we compare it with the other digits. And this is a pulley injury. Okay, that covers the upper extremity. We're going to move on to the, to the lower extremity. And uh, we'll just start by uh, reviewing the anatomy, some of the insertion sites uh, where we can see some uh, avulsion fractures. And anterior superior iliac spine is where the sartorius inserts. Anterior inferior iliac spine is the rectus femoris, gluteus medius, uh, greater troch, lesser trochs, the iliac psoas. Then we have the hamstrings on the ischial tuberosity. And they like to show these avulsion injuries either on plain film or uh, MR and either ask what the, uh, what the tendon is that's avulsed. Here's a double line sign again. A, a more common location for avascular necrosis is within the femoral head. And in this particular instance, we see an area of geographic abnormality involving the femoral head with a double line sign. We see a, a black line coming across with a white line parallel in it. This is diagnostic of avascular necrosis. Uh, when, you show, when they show you this, uh, just nail it, give them the answer they want, and you'll do great. Uh, stress fractures, uh, another common uh, entity that they show, and they may show them anywhere up and down the, the, uh, the lower extremity, so we're going to look at several examples in the second half of the talk here. Uh, stress fractures on plain film all look alike. They're this sclerotic or lucent line. Typically, it's a sclerotic, ill-defined line that runs perpendicular to the normal trabecular pattern. Uh, the femoral neck is a very common location. Uh, having worked in the Air Force, we're down at Wilford Hall where we have about 50,000 recruits coming through every year, and they put them out there. They go from couch potato to warrior in about six, six weeks, and uh, we saw a lot of these injuries, but this is a very classic appearance. You see this area of sclerotic density running perpendicular to the normal trabecular pattern. On MR imaging, it'll look very similar. We'll see this dark line, again, running perpendicular to the normal trabecular pattern. This is a T1-weighted image with the bright uh, marrow, bright subcutaneous fat, no joint effusion seen, uh, no bright fluid seen in the joint. So this is a dark line on T1 with the surrounding marrow edema. represents an incomplete stress fracture. On the T2, we'll see, uh, again, this is a T2. We see the fat-saturated marrow. We see bright signal within the joint, so we know this is fluid. That, that uh, tells us the T2-weighted image we're dealing with. We see this area of linear low signal abnormality running perpendicular to the long axis with the surrounding marrow edema, stress fracture of the medial aspect of the hip. You can also see these laterally. This is a 47-year-old with left hip pain and started with a lateral stress fracture. Uh, and this one went on to completion. So again, the lateral stress fractures are at a higher risk for completion. And this one went on to completion with... Uh, with uh, actually an impaction injury of the femoral neck. <clears throat> Let's look at a couple of these avulsion injuries. Uh, they may show you a case like this with a little piece of cortex adjacent to the anterior superior iliac spine, and they'll want you to know that this is the sartorius or tensor fasciolata attachment site. Uh, and this, this occurs in sprinters, hurdlers, uh, cheerleaders get this injury. If we see it down at the anterior inferior iliac spine, 
This is the insertion site for the rectus femoris. And uh, these can be misinterpreted as loose bodies. They can be misinterpreted as tumors in this location. But when you see these little areas of cortex pulled off adjacent to the anterior inferior iliac spine, especially in an adolescent with the growth plate still open, you need to be thinking of an avulsion injury of the rectus femoris. Here's another uh, case of an old avulsion injury. Uh, this is a case that I saw a few years back, and this had been uh, misread as an osteochondroma, and they were following this patient with serial exams uh, uh, every year. Well, as soon as I saw this, I knew this was nothing more than some myositis ossificans within an old avulsion of the rectus femoris. So when you see this uh, pattern arising adjacent to the anterior superior or anterior inferior iliac spine, this represents an old avulsion injury. And here's just another case with myositis ossificans within the rectus femoris secondary to an old avulsion injury. Now, they may also show you the MR correlate, and this is uh, the rectus femoris coming in and inserting into the anterior inferior iliac spine. We see high signal. Uh, now, in this particular case, there was no bony abnormality. It's just a pure avulsion of the tendon, and uh, uh, the MR can be very helpful in making that diagnosis if there's no associated bony lesion. Then finally, the ischial tuberosity, uh, avulsion injury. This is a hamstring or adductor magnus attachment site. And with this particular avulsion injury, there can be a huge piece of bone taken off with it. These things are sometimes are quite massive. And then they, when they heal, they have this fibrous uh, uh, healing that occurs in this location. These patients can have persistent pain. But oftentimes, this piece of bone uh, remains uh, adjacent to the ischial tuberosity rather than healing back. And so we'll see this thing for, for many years in this patient. And these, these are often confused with some type of malignancy or tumor. But when you see this uh, large piece of bone adjacent to the ischial tuberosity, uh, just realize that represents a uh, avulsion of the ischial tuberosity. We can see it on CT. They may show it to you on MR, plain film. And this typically occurs with sprinters. <clears throat> okay, now beware of any avulsion fracture of the lesser tuberosity. Uh, if you have an avulsion fracture of the lesser tuberosity in an adult, these are uh, pathologic fractures until proven otherwise. I've probably seen about a dozen of these now, and every single one of them has been a, a pathologic fracture. So if they show you a pathologic fracture of the uh, lesser tuberosity, uh, you need to make sure that you uh, identify the fact that this is likely a pathologic fracture. In an adult, in a child, we can see, we can see avulsion injuries here uh, that are not pathologic. Okay, pubic symphysis injuries or osteitis pubis. Uh, these can occur in uh, athletes, uh, especially athletes that do a lot of changing direction, like uh, people who play ice hockey, soccer, people who are running and changing directions rapidly. And the, the finding uh, on either plain film or MR, or on, on plain film we may see osteolysis or lucency at the uh, pubic symphysis, or we may see increased sclerosis if it's an older injury. On MR Im imaging we may see high signal on the T2-weighted uh, sequence involving the pubic symphysis. So this is a stress-related injury that occurs uh, in runners, and in particular in runners who do a lot of changing in direction. Okay, the snapping hip syndrome, uh, femoroacetabular uh, impingement is something that's uh, very popular in the orthopedic literature right now, and that kind of ties in with the snapping hip syndrome. When we have a patient that presents with this, we really have three three types of snapping hip. We can have the external type, the internal type of snapping hip, or the intra-articular type. And these are patients who have an audible snapping hip when they flex and extend the hip. Sometimes they're symptomatic and sometimes they're not. Uh, the external type is actually a, uh, a process where the uh, thickened iliotibial tract snaps over the greater tuberosity. And on MR imaging, we're going to see edema deep to the iliotibial tract. We may see trochanteric bursitis, and we may see thickening of the iliotibial tract. And as that snaps back and forth across the greater uh, uh, trochanter, we can uh, get an audible clicking or an audible snapping and pain. The internal type occurs when the iliopsoas tendon uh, pops back and forth over the iliopectineal eminence. And we can try to work this up with MR imaging. And occasionally, we'll see fluid collecting within the iliopsoas bursa. Iliopsoas bursa is the longest and largest bursa in the body. It sits right on top of the iliopsoas tendon. It's this cylindrical fluid collection that runs along the psoas tendon. And uh, if, it, if it snaps back and forth over the iliopectineal eminence, it can lead to irritation and fluid within the bursa. <clears throat> More likely, however, we're going to have to do an injection of the bursa, iliopsoas bursagram, 
under fluoroscopic guidance, we'd go down and inject the bursa, and then we would reproduce the, the, uh, the, uh, the position of the hip that causes the, the audible snapping. We can actually see this thing snap over the iliopectoneal eminence, and we can actually hear the audible click as it snaps over the iliopectoneal eminence of the hip. And this is the iliopsoas bursagram for the internal type. <clears throat> Then finally, the intraarticular type of snapping hip typically occurs because of an intraarticular process, and this can occur because of internal derangement, such as a labral tear, or can occur with intraarticular bodies, uh, such as synovial chondromatosis. I'm sure Dr. Parsons uh, showed some examples of this earlier in the week, but these are ossified uh, uh, bodies within the, within the hip joint. We can see them on MR as these areas of round, low signal intensity, or on plain film. Now, the acetabular labrum abnormalities that you may see, you need to know the normal appearance of the acetabular labrum, and this is best evaluated in the coronal T2 plane. And just like the coronal uh, image of the shoulder, we're going to see a black uh, triangular structure that extends right off of the osseous acetabulum. We'll have the hyaline articular cartilage, which is intermediate in signal intensity, and we typically have this uh, recess that occurs along the lateral aspect. So any fluid coming up lateral to the acetabulum is normal. What we're looking for is fluid coming deep uh, along the medial aspect of the acetabulum or between the bony, uh, as, between the bony acetabulum and the, and the uh, acetabular labrum. So this is what a labral tear will look like. This is a T2-weighted image. We see uh, dark subcutaneous fat, so we know there's fat saturation. We see high signal within the joint, so we know this is a fluid within the joint. And this is a T2-weighted image. And now we see this triangular structure hanging off the lateral aspect of the acetabulum, but we see bright fluid extending deep to it between the bone and the acetabular labrum. And this is what an acetabular labral tear will look like. And this is, uh, can be associated with intraarticular pain, decreased range of motion, the clicking sensation, the same symptoms we can get with the external and uh, internal type of uh, snapping hip syndrome. Okay, moving on down the leg a little bit, uh, rectus femoris, partial thickness tears, uh, occur quite often in athletes, and this is a mimic for a tumor. Uh, when these patients present, they often, in, they often uh, tear the musculotendinous junction, which is down in the mid-thigh, and they get a large hematoma at the time of tear. This typically occurs during sprinting, and they, will present, they may present at that time or they may present a few months later with a big palpable mass in the anterior aspect of the thigh. And when we image these uh, individuals, we see a hematoma or a, a mass within the uh, substance of the rectus femoris, and this represents nothing more than a hematoma with a tear of the rectus femoris musculotendinous junction. So don't misinterpret this as a, as a mass in the thigh. <clears throat> Another uh, uh, entity that can be misinterpreted as a mass on occasion is the tennis leg, which is the rupture of the plantaris. This has a very specific MR appearance. Uh, when we see a rupture of the plantaris muscle, we see uh, a tubular fluid-like collection that tracks along the location, the expected location of the plantaris tendon. So on T2-weighted images, when you look in the posterior calf and you see this tubular collection of fluid, that represents a uh, disruption of the plantaris tendon, usually at the musculotendinous junction. And the differential diagnosis is a tear of the gastrocnemius muscle. We can see that the gastrocnemius muscles are, are normal. There's no strain or tear of the gastrocnemius. <clears throat> okay, as we move down the leg a little bit, uh, to the level of mid-thigh. Uh, again, stress fractures can occur in this region. Uh, here we see an area of abnormal periosteal reaction. It looks somewhat aggressive, but when we look closer on the plane film, we see a linear, a linear area running transverse to the long axis of the femur. When we do an MR, same thing. We see this little linear area of low signal abnormality running, tra running uh, perpendicular to the long axis of the femur, and this represents a stress fracture. So you wouldn't want to misinterpret this as a, a Ewing sarcoma or lymphoma or an osteosarcoma. Uh, the key in this case is the perpendicular low signal black line uh, that runs perpendicular to the long axis of the femur. Okay, every test that I reviewed had multiple questions on the knee, uh, so this is a good, good place to pay attention. Um, shoulder and knee seem to be the big, the big areas, but uh, I think every test had a question about the anterior cruciate ligament. And the types of things they would ask, they would point to it in different planes and ask you to be able to identify the anterior cruciate ligament in, in different planes. So let's just review that real briefly. Uh, in the sagittal plane, we see it arising along the inner aspect of the 
lateral femoral condyle. It should parallel the roof of the intercondylar notch, but it should not touch the roof of the intercondylar notch. And then it comes down and inserts between the, uh, or adjacent to the tibial spines. As the ACL comes a little more distal, the two bundles uh, diverge a little bit and spread out, and we often see some intermediate signal between the two bundles distally. We can see that even uh, more nicely on the uh, coronal imaging plane. And again, they may paint, point to the structure and ask you to just identify it, and they'll list, you know, posterior cruciate, anterior cruciate, they'll list different ligaments once you to be able to identify this as the anterior cruciate ligament. Uh, also, they'll ask it in the axial plane. And in the axial plane, you just have to identify it as arising along the inner aspect of the lateral femoral condyle, and it's an oblong, uh, oval-appearing black structure that's plastered right up against the bone. And as you see, this oval black structure plastered right up against the bone and the, along the inner aspect of the intercondylar notch, that represents the anterior cruciate ligament. That was asked several times on, on the in-service exams. Uh, now, this is another question they ask is they'll show this appearance, and in this appearance, in the expected location of that oval black structure, we see high signal abnormality. And this represents an avulsion of the anterior cruciate ligament from the femoral attachment site, and this is referred to as the empty notch sign. Uh, so in the expected location of this black oval structure, we see high signal fluid representing an avulsion of the ACL proximally. Okay, the other uh, findings that they'll show at the ACL is just a complete disruption in the mid-substance. And again, this is the normal appearance paralleling but not touching the roof of the intercondylar notch. If you see this amorphous appearance with nothing that looks like a normal ACL, or if you just see high signal traversing the fibers of the ACL, that represents a disruption. More commonly, they'll show uh, one of the bony abnormalities associated with ACL disruption and then want you to know that there is an ACL disruption based on the osseous abnormality, so we're going to review those next. Here's a classic example. Here we see the ACL. We follow the fibers down. Looks very nice. I don't see any disruption of the anterior cruciate ligament fibers. There's a little more posterior bowing than we like, but if we look a little further, we see there's an avulsion of the uh, tibial attachment site. And so this is an avulsion of the anterior uh, cruciate ligament at its tibial attachment site. These occur more commonly in the adolescent age group. Uh, there's been several reports more recently of this occurring in adults, especially in adult skiers. Okay, another classic uh, ca case or an example that they would show you, they'll show you this area of uh, what is referred to as a deep sulcus sign. There's deepening of the lateral femoral sulcus. There's adjacent marrow edema. They may show you this on MR or on plain film. And what they want you to make the diagnosis is that the uh, answer is going to be the ACL is torn. And this is secondary to an impaction injury of the lateral femoral condyle against the posterior lateral tibial plateau during the pivot shift mechanism of injury, resulting in the ACL injury. So they're going to show you this picture, and the answer is going to be ACL disruption. They may also show you this example with marrow edema in the posterior lateral femoral condyle, posterior lateral tibial plateau. Arrows are on the wrong side here. This is uh, lateral over here, but this is uh, lateral. Uh, the, the image they're going to show you is going to have lateral femoral condyle marrow edema Lateral tibial plateau marrow edema occurs secondary to the pivot shift mechanism of injury. When you see this, the answer is uh, anterior cruciate ligament disruption. And then finally, they may show you this appearance. Again, either on plain film or MR, we see a little avulsion along the lateral aspect of the tibial plateau, the sagome fracture. They may ask you to name the fracture. Or they may ask you to make the diagnosis that's associated with ACL injury or ACL tear. When you see these, mar these bone marrow edema patterns and these injuries, they, it be, it's extremely difficult for them to occur, or extremely rare for them to occur without an ACL injury for these uh, three particular uh, marrow edema patterns because the tibia cannot shift far enough posterior to give you that impaction injury if the ACL is intact. So when you see those, uh, the, the answer is torn ACL. <clears throat> okay, just briefly look at the PCL. Uh, the PCL rises along the medial femoral condyle, the inner, inner notch, and then, it, and then extends down posteriorly to insert on the posterior slanted portion of the tibia. Uh, this is best seen on the sagittal plane. We usually see it in one or two imaging planes. And the dashboard mechanism of injury is the mechanism associated with disruption of the PCL. We see uh, the tibia in the flex knee, the tibia is driven posteriorly. You get a bone contusion along the anterior aspect of the tibia, as we see here. If you see this bone contusion pattern, uh, think about disruption of the posterior cruciate ligament. This can occur in an MVA. It can occur if someone falls on a flex knee and drives the, uh, the tibia posteriorly. I've seen several of these in football players that end up at the bottom. You know, they fall on a flex knee, end up at the bottom of a pile, and have a, a torn 
uh, PCL. Okay, iliotibial band syndrome. The iliotibial band comes down laterally and inserts on Gertie's tubercle. Uh, if they show this abnormality, what they're going to be showing is uh, the iliotibial band friction syndrome, where we see edema deep to the iliotibial band. We can see it on the coronal plane. We can see it on the axial imaging plane. Uh, when we see this, this is a friction syndrome that occurs uh, typically in long-distance runners. There may also be some marrow edema, reactive marrow edema within the adjacent uh, lateral femoral condyle, iliotibial band syndrome. <clears throat> now, what about this bone contusion pattern? If you see this, you should be able to make the diagnosis right off the bat. This is a uh, transient lateral patellar dislocation. This occurs with the lateral dislocation of the patella. The inferior aspect of the medial pole of the patella impacts against the lateral femoral condyle, giving this classic bone marrow edema pattern. When we see this uh, pattern, uh, there are a couple of things that can uh, be surgical indication. One is an osteochondral injury of either the patella or the femoral condyle, and we see these quite frequently with a loose intraarticular body or a uh, osteochondral fragment that comes off the median eminence or the medial patellar facet or the lateral femoral condyle, or we may see disruption in the medial patellofemoral ligament. Here we see the vastus medialis obliquus muscle. The medial patellofemoral ligament arises along the superior pole of the patella, comes back, blends with the deep fibers of the vastus medialis obliquus, and then inserts into the adductor tubercle. So if we see fluid uplifting and elevating the uh, vastus medialis obliquus, there's been disruption of the medial patellofemoral ligament. Okay, what about this? They may ask, uh, uh, on several of these questions, they show an injury and then ask the mechanism of injury. Here we see uh, a knee with disruption of the medial collateral ligament. Here we see the iliotibial band joint effusion coming up here. We see some uh, joint fluid here, but we see complete disruption of the proximal fibers of the medial collateral ligament. And in this particular uh, case, this is a, a valgus stress injury. It can occur uh, secondary to stress injury. It results in disruption of the medial collateral ligament proximally. The chronic injury, we may see the Pellegrini striata with calcification in the chronic injury. Or on MR imaging, uh, we may see a thickened, uh, markedly thickened medial collateral ligament which uh, is a chronic sequelae to disruption. Here we see the ACL has been uh, repaired. We see the hardware from the ACL. And in this case, this patient also had an old MCL injury with persistent thickening. Okay, also uh, meniscal questions are very common. Uh, I don't think I went through a single test where they didn't ask one or two questions on menisci. And we're going to review the things that were uh, most commonly touched on. First of all, the meniscus is a fibrovascular structure, so it should be black on all pulse sequences. You shouldn't see any signal within the, within the uh, normal meniscus. T1 is the most sensitive a sequence for detecting tears, whereas T2 is the most specific. So if you want to find the most tears, you look on your T1. If you see something on your T2, it's very specific for a tear and unlikely to be anything other than a tear. Okay, as we image through the meniscus in the sagittal plane, as we look peripherally, we see this bow tie configuration, as we see here. And then as you start to move more centrally, the, bow, the central aspect of the bow tie uh, thins out and attenuates and then eventually you just get these two triangles with an anterior and a posterior triangle. Now, we can have intersubstance signal. As long as it does not touch the articular surface, it just represents in a child uh, prominent vascularity and in an adult intersubstance degeneration. If we see globular signal within the substance but not touching the surface, that's grade one uh, intersubstance degeneration. If we see linear intersubstance not touching the surface, that's grade two. And if it touches the surface, as we show in this, uh, case, that's grade three, and grade three signal equals a tear. So if you have linear signal within the substance of the meniscus touching either the superior or inferior surface, then that represents a tear. If it touches the peripheral surface, that does not represent a tear. If it touches out here at the capsular uh, junction, this does not represent a tear. It has to touch the bottom or the top surface. There are three direct signs of meniscal tear. They may show you one of these. Uh, grade, uh, the first direct sign is Surfacing signal that we just talked about, grade three signal or signal extending to the surface of the meniscus. The, uh, here we see a horizontal tear. Here we see a vertical tear involving the free edge. And here we see a complex tear. Anytime you see signal touching both the top and the bottom or both the superior and inferior articular surfaces, you have an unstable fragment. Uh, that means this fragment right out here is unstable and can flap in and out. And that's an unstable uh, fragment of a complex tear. The second direct sign is missing meniscal tissue. 
So if you have, this is out the most peripheral image, we should have that nice bow tie configuration. In the absence of the history of surgery, if you have missing meniscal tissue, that's diagnostic of a meniscal tear. And then the third direct sign of a meniscal tear is displaced meniscal fragment. And here we have a meniscal fragment displaced anteriorly. Uh, so if you have missing fragment uh, uh, or displaced fragment, that's a sign of a, a meniscal tear. Now this is the most likely displaced meniscal fragment they're going to show you. And what's this represent? This is the, uh, here's the PCL. We see the nice uh, curvilinear PCL in its normal position. But then we see a second structure that looks like a, a second PCL or a double PCL. And this is the double PCL sign. And this is a diagnostic of a bucket handle tear, typically of the uh, medial meniscus. Uh, the lateral meniscus can't move into the mid portion because the ACL blocks it and doesn't allow it to move in. So when you see this double PCL, this is the uh, buckle, bucket handle fragment of the meniscus moving into the intercondylar notch. And they'll show, this, they'll show this one sagittal image and expect you to know that this is a, a bucket handle tear of the medial meniscus. Okay, this is also a very common question is to ask the meniscal, uh, the meniscal ligaments. They'll point to these and they'll ask you what's the diagnosis or what is it pointing to. Uh, your, your, question will, your answers will include a meniscal tear. And in this case, hopefully they'll include the anterior transverse meniscal ligament is one of the choices because this is the insertion of the anterior transverse meniscal ligament as it comes across and inserts into the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. We can see it on the drawing coming across here. And this is a mimic for a meniscal tear. They want to make sure you're not misinterpreting this as a meniscal tear and operating on these uh, unnecessarily. Uh, so very commonly they show either this or uh, the meniscofemoral attachment. And we have uh, the two meniscofemoral ligaments, the Humphreys ligament. If you see one in front of the ACL, I'm sorry, in front of the PCL, it's Humphreys ligament. If you see one running posterior, as in this case, to the PCL, that's Risberg's ligament. And as it comes down and inserts into the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, you have what looks like surfacing grade three signal. But this is not a meniscal tear. This is simply the insertion of the meniscofemoral ligament. And here we see it coming across on the coronal plane. Uh, so this is a very common question they like to ask. They, they just point to it, and they give you the uh, differential of a tear versus uh, the meniscofemoral ligament. The popliteus tendon sheath is just behind the, lateral, uh, the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. And when fluid tracks into the popliteus tendon sheath, it can also mimic grade three signal. And they may point to this structure and expect you to know that the popliteus tendon sits immediately behind the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Here we see the uh, fibula, so we know we're dealing with the lateral meniscus. And here we see it in the artwork. Okay, discoid, is, discoid meniscus is another common area that, uh, that they ask questions about. And with the discoid meniscus, we have an enlarged meniscus that covers the entire weight-bearing aspect of the uh, femoral condyle. And uh, well over 95% of these are lateral uh, in, in location, so these typically occur laterally. They have an increased risk of meniscal tears. And interestingly, the meniscal tears are more often medial than lateral, and this can occur uh, because of altered weight-bearing, supposedly. Uh, but there is an increased incidence of tears involving both the medial and lateral meniscus when we see a lateral discoid meniscus. If they show you it in the sagittal plane, they'll show two or three uh, sagittal images with the meniscus touching from front to back on several images. If they show it in the sagittal plane, they'll show, I'm sorry, if they show it in the coronal plane, they'll show an image where the meniscus extends more than 50% over the articular surface, and that represents a discoid meniscus. Okay, what about this diagnosis? Here we see on a T2-weighted image a large fluid collection adjacent to a horizontal cleavage tear, and this just represents a, a meniscal tear. Uh, greater than 95% of these are associated with a horizontal tear of the adjacent meniscus. Differential diagnosis includes a, a cruciate ganglion, a bursitis, or other ganglia about the knee. This question was commonly asked as well. Show a plain thumb finding with uh, chondrocalcinosis, and they expect you to know the differential for chondrocalcinosis uh, uh, calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease, hemochromatosis, hyperparathyroid disease, or the most common causes, Wilson's disease, also a known cause of chondrocalcinosis. <clears throat> okay, uh, hemarthrosis uh, on MR imaging. What will uh, if we if we have a lipohemarthrosis, we'll actually see fat, which saturates out, uh, floating superiorly. Then we'll see the serum, and then the uh, then the red cells floating. Uh, below, so we may see uh, three different fluid levels within the knee, and of course this would indicate a, 
uh, an intraarticular fracture, if we have a lipohemarthrosis. On the plain film, you see this area of lucency, which represents the fat, which is more lucent than the adjacent fluid or muscle. So if they show you this uh, plain film of the knee with a uh, layering area of fat, uh, this is a lipohemarthrosis, and we should be looking for an intraarticular fracture. Now, this is another common question, is the uh, anatomy surrounding a Baker cyst. Everybody knows this is a Baker cyst, but they'll point to one of these tendons and they'll ask you to determine which one's the semimembranosus and which one's the medial head of the gastroc. Well, the semimembranosus comes down uh, more uh, centrally and the medial head of the gastroc is more peripheral or towards the central aspect of the knee. Uh, but along the peripheral aspect here will be the semimembranosus tendon. <clears throat> Okay, well, we're going to talk just a minute about stress fractures of the tibia. Another common question is to show stress fractures of the tibia in various forms. And uh, these typically occur in runners or in people who increase their level of training or, tra or, or uh, change their level of training or their type of training. Uh, you may just see some marrow edema initially, but over time you'll start to see an area of linear signal abnormality that again runs perpendicular to the normal trabecular pattern. And on MR, this is a T1, we'll see a dark line on T1 a dark line on T2 of surrounding marrow edema, and this is a tibial plateau uh, stress fracture. We can see these in the uh, mid-shaft of the tibia. They show it in the mid-shaft of the tibia. They're likely to show a nuclear medicine study showing an area of linear signal abnormality within the mid-shaft of the tibia. Now, this, is, uh, this was 7 August. A week later, we see the area of abnormality on plain film. Nothing on the, I'm sorry, there's nothing on the plain film on 7 August. A week later, we can uh, see the area of abnormality on nuclear medicine bone scan, which is much more sensitive and is going to pick this up much earlier. And finally, a month later, we're starting to see the uh, periosteal reaction uh, on plain film. Okay, we can also see these on plain film as areas of sclerotic uh, signal abnormality extending perpendicular again to the long axis of the bone. Uh, we see it here distally and proximally. So these are stress fractures of the tibia. Uh, now, a little bit un of an unusual appearing stress fracture is one of a longitudinal stress fracture. And here we see a longitudinal signal abnormality running the length of the tibia with a breach of the cortex. And this can happen either anterior or posterior. And this represents a longitudinal stress fracture of the tibia, a little less common, but again, should not be misinterpreted as, a, uh, as some type of a neoplasm. We can also see the same appearance in the distal fibula. When these occur in the fibula, it's typically people who run on uh, hard surfaces or bank surfaces can get these uh, stress fractures of the distal fibula. Okay, we'll look just for a moment at the ankle, and we'll be wrapping up in just the next uh, couple minutes here. Uh, the ankle is a, also a common place where they ask a lot of questions, and they like to ask questions about the tendons. We'll start out with the Achilles tendon. The Achilles tendon should be a dark uh, structure that comes down and inserts into the posterior calcaneus. There should be no thickening or bulbous appearance to the tendon as we see here, and there should never be any intrinsic signal within the Achilles tendon. So here we see on a T1, we see the bright subcutaneous fat, we see the bright marrow fat. Uh, in the joint, we don't see any fluid, so we know this is a T1 weighted image, and we see thickening of the tendon, and we see increased intermediate signal. We come over here, this is a T2 fat saturated uh, sagittal image. We see bright fluid representing some fluid within the, uh, within the ankle. Uh, so this is a T2-weighted image. Again, we see thickening, and we see areas of increased signal abnormalities. This is what chronic Achilles tendinosis appears like. If they show it on the axial plane, at the most, the anterior aspect of the Achilles tendon should be flat. It should never be convex anteriorly. So when it starts to look round or convex anteriorly, that represents uh, Achilles tendinosis. So they may show you this and uh, give you the differential of a torn Achilles tendon, Achilles tendonitis, uh, and in this case, this would be Achilles tendonitis. If there's a tear, there will be a gap with retraction of the tendon. So you actually see fluid running across the tendon with retraction of the fibers. Okay, what about the diagnosis here? Uh, this is a very common question. They point to one of the tendons that's abnormal, and then they ask you uh, what the tendon is and what, uh, what the abnormality is. But we see here's the fibula. Here's the, let's look at what we do know. This is the Achilles tendon posteriorly. Here's the fibula, so we know this is lateral, this is medial, and we have three tendons medially here, and the most medial one uh, has signal running within it, has a split or a cleavage right through the middle of the tendon, so this is a, a longitudinal split through this tendon. Well, which one is it? Uh, well, remember your anatomy, uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry. We have the posterior tibialis is the first one, flexor digitorum, 
the neurovascular bundle, and then the flexor hallucis longus. So they may point to any of these tendons and expect you to know which one it is and whether or not it's torn or if there's tendinopathy. If you see thickening and intrinsic signal, it's tendinopathy. If you see fluid and a gap, then it represents a tear. Uh, again, we have the tibialis anterior, uh, extensor hallucis, and extensor digitorum anteriorly. So know the tendons in the axial plane, which one is which. And this is a tibialis anterior disruption. Uh, this is someone who dropped a paint can on the anterior ankle, an older gentleman. And here we see marked thickening with extensive partial thickness tearing of the tibialis anterior. Uh, if this is a, a sport in, in, injury, it typically occurs that they run or march on inclines. But this is a direct trauma injury. Okay, now what if you get something like this? Here's an appearance. We have a, a cross section. We have a T1 and a T2 weighted image. And uh, if they show you this image, it's probably going to be a tendon abnormality they're looking for. So how are you going to hone in on what's abnormal? Well, what I always do is I, I go to my T2-weighted image and I look where there's some bright signal. If you look for the bright signal on the T2-weighted image, that's typically where your abnormality is. So we come over here and that, that localizes the abnormality to the lateral aspect. Here's the fibula. Here's the uh, perineal tendons. We have high signal around the perineal tendons. So if you're sitting there looking at an image, uh, one of the keys you can, you can use is, especially on a T2-weighted image, look for the area of high signal. That's usually where the abnormality is. So we come over here and look, and we see uh, there's one, two, three perineal tendons, whereas we normally should just have two. And this represents a split perineal brevis. Uh, when we have a split perineal brevis, it's brevis on the outside, longus, and then brevis again. The uh, longus actually causes a split as it compresses the brevis between the posterior aspect of the fibula and the uh, perineal longus. So if they point to one of these, it's the center tendon that represents the perineal longus, which is, and then the brevis is split and on either side. <clears throat> okay, here again we have, uh, we're honing in on the lateral aspect of the ankle. Here's the fibula. Now we see the perineal tendon out uh, subluxed laterally. Uh, so they may just ask you to make the diagnosis of a lateral subluxation of the perineal tendon, or they may ask you what the injury is, and the injury is a disruption of the superior perineal retinaculum. Uh, secondary to an inversion injury that allows lateral subluxation of the perineal tendons. Tarsal tunnel syndrome, unlike carpal tunnel syndrome, tarsal tunnel syndrome uh, typically is secondary to a mass rather than a repetitive injury. So if, if a patient presents with tarsal tunnel syndrome and pain in the distribution of the posterior tibialis uh, nerve, then you need to be doing an MR, and the most common uh, mass is going to be a ganglion that extends into the tarsal tunnel. And uh, they may ask you the boundaries of the tarsal tunnel. We have the flexor digitorum longus, flexor halsus longus, anteriorly the talus and calcaneus, and posteriorly the flexor retinaculum. Okay, there's a couple, I just want to cover a couple of the most commonly missed fractures about the ankle. And number one is the lesion of the Taylor dome. They show you an AP view of the Taylor dome. Look very closely for any kind of a lucency underneath the Taylor dome uh, cortex. We can see it nicely on MR and on CT. There's four types. Type 1 is just marrow edema. Type 2 is an incomplete disruption of the cortex. This is a type 3 where there's a complete disruption of the cortex, but the fragment remains in situ. And then type 4 is when the fragment is displaced. Type 3s and 4s are definitely surgically, uh, surgically treated. Type 2 uh, occasionally is also treated surgically. Okay, what about this? They may show you a lateral view of the ankle. Here we see a uh, disruption of the lateral Taylor process. Very commonly missed. Up to 50% of these are missed initially on the initial plane films. Uh, we can see it on the AP view. We can see it as a disruption of the lateral triangle on the lateral view. This is something we need to look on every ankle image we look at. It's easiest to pick up on the lateral view by uh, making sure there's no disruption in that lateral, uh, lateral triangle. This is the snow borders fracture. Occurs as a shearing injury secondary to inversion injury with dorsiflexion of the foot. And the problem with this is we get disruption through the subtalar joint, an articular surface step off of the subtalar joint, and these patients go on to develop a severe uh, osteoarthritis of the subtalar joint if the uh, joint isn't reapproximated appro appropriately. And about a third of these patients will go on to triarthrodesis if it's not picked up initially. Uh, tarsal coalition they also like to show as an, as an entity. And typically we'll see a nice joint space uh, between the articulations of the tarsal bones. If you see either a fibrous coalition or you can have an osseous coalition where there's solid bone. But here we have completely lost the 
the normal appearance of the joint as we see here, and we see this kind of undulating appearance of the adjacent bone. This is a fibrous coalition. This is a 32-year-old marathon runner, came in with dorsal foot pain. This is another injury that's commonly missed. Uh, this patient came in with dorsal foot pain, and when we do the mag view here, we can see an area of linear signal abnormality extending across the short axis of the uh, tarsonavicular, and this represents a stress fracture of the tarsonavicular. Uh, these are best imaged on either CT or MR, and here we see the tarsonavicular with a low signal area of abnormality running across the short axis. Typically occurs in the center third of the navicular associated with a long second metatarsal. The uh, force from the second metatarsal is, is propagated right up to the second metatarsal and deposited in the central third of the uh, navicular bone, which is the more avascular portion of the bone, and we get a stress fracture. Once he's complete, it's bad news for the patient, so we want to prevent that. Then the final injury I want to show you is that of the Liz Frank injury. Just remember, if they show you an AP view of the foot, you want to make sure this is the normal foot here. Make sure that the first, second, and third metatarsals line up uh, appropriately with their adjacent uh, cuneiform. On this side, we see about a two millimeter step off. That's all it takes. That's a disruption of the Liz Frank ligament with a, uh, with a uh, subtle subluxation. So any subluxation whatsoever is abnormal. Now, they may also show you the MR appearance of this. And with the MR appearance, if you remember the anatomy, the Liz Frank ligament arises along the medial, uh, along the lateral aspect of the medial cuneiform and then inserts into the base of the second metatarsal. With MR imaging on a coronal plane, we can nicely see the uh, Liz Frank ligament, and we should be able to see that intact. So if there's any question, MR imaging can clearly show an intact or a disrupted Liz Frank ligament. And here's one where there's some uh, fractures through the base of the uh, second, third, and fourth metatarsals and where that Liz Frank ligament normally lives, we see high signal and no evidence of an intact uh, Liz Frank ligament. So that completes a review of imaging, and uh, uh, good luck to you guys.